Let's begin our time of worship this evening, starting with hymn number 108. All glory, laud, and honor to the Redeemer King. All glory, laud, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children may sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou King David's royal Son, who in the Lord's name Thomas the King and Blessed One. The company of angels are praising Thee on high, and mortal men and all things created make reply. The people of the Hebrews with psalms before Thee went. Our praise and prayer and anthem before thee we present. To thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise. To thee how high exalted our melody we raise. Thou didst accept their praise, as accept the praise we bring. Who in all good delightest, thou good and gracious King. All right, let's take our Bibles, and we're going to begin reading through the book of Nahum, the Old Testament, and the reason we're going to Begin with Nahum, as he would be the next prophet that the Lord raised up after Hosea. Hosea preached and proclaimed the message of God and Christ to the northern kingdoms, but as we have seen that the Lord took them into captivity, now the prophets that the Lord would raise up would be for the tribes of Judah in the south. And God would preserve those tribes of Judah for another 200 years after the end of the northern kingdom. And the prophets that he raised up to preach to those tribes, really it's two, there's Judah and there's Benjamin, would be Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Ezekiel, and even Jeremiah, and then Haggai, Zechariah, Joel, and Malachi. And so as we continue to progress down through these particular prophets, I wanted us to continue our scripture reading and ask the Lord to give us direction as we read. So here's the book of Nahum. Time to find this in your Bible and mark it. We may not be so accustomed to studying some of these that they called minor prophets. The reason they're minor isn't because their message was any less important, but rather their chapters were fewer. As you can see, Nahum here had but three particular chapters, and yet a very powerful message. So it begins here, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. Now, Nineveh would have been one of the chief Assyrian cities. Remember, the Assyrians were the ones that came down and took the 10 tribes of Israel captive. And the Assyrians also, Nineveh, would have been the city where God had sent Jonah a hundred years earlier. So this helps situate a little bit where we're reading here. Remember, the Lord sent Jonah, and the city, the king, repented, and God spared the city. But as time went on, Nineveh 
returned back to its idolatry. And in that sense, we can say it wasn't true repentance, at least not for the following generations. We have, even in our history in the United States, a, a period of time that historians call the Great Awakening, and the Lord raised up some preachers that had some liberty to go forth and to preach men like George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards. One little known preacher that I've read that I believe the Lord had taught the gospel was Azahel Nettleton. And then, of course, you had David Brainerd during this time. He preached to the Indians. And Adoniram Judson that the Lord raised up and sent over to Burma. And then William Carey. So it was a period of time in the 1700s that it seemed that the Lord was blessing with the hearing of the gospel. And yet here we are today, 300 some years later, and what do we have? We look around and there's not even an inkling of anything that resembles the gospel of God's glory in the Lord Jesus Christ in popular religion. It's gone just the other way. So here was one Nahum that the Lord raised up, and his message was primarily to Nineveh, this wicked city, and yet at the same time, you can see in verse 15 at the end of this chapter, that there's a message of hope that is addressed to Judah, because you can remember in our studies in 2 Kings, it's this same Assyrian, Sennacherib, that had come to surround Jerusalem and sought to destroy it, but God purposed otherwise. God had purposed to preserve Jerusalem and uh, for David's sake, as we're going we're gonna to see, for Christ's sake is what that means, because from this remnant that God would preserve, the Lord would bring forth his son several hundred years later. Now when it says here that he was the Elkoshite, not a lot is known about this place. Some place it in Assyria, but some place it in Galilee, that it would have been a city the name of a city known otherwise as Capernaum. When you, when you hear the word Capernaum, Nahum at the end, it literally means the village of Nahum. This, of course, was the birthplace of Peter and John and Andrew and James, as well as the tax collector Matthew was from Capernaum. That's where our Lord Jesus Christ had his ministry. and went forth from there preaching the gospel. And here we have a, a phototype or a, a prototype, if you will, of the message where while Nahum was that one that would preach from this place in his day, it was forward looking to the Lord Jesus Christ when he would come. Now you can see his message. This is really what it's all about. God is jealous. That's not a passion like we know jealousy, but it's the sense of being jealous for his honor and his glory. It speaks of his attributes. And as we continue to read down here, this is truly the vision. That word vision in verse one literally means burden. The weight of this message to be lifted up and to be proclaimed was a burden weight and I know that any that the Lord has raised up to preach the gospel of Christ certainly it is a weight that he should be glorified and honored when Paul wrote of coming to the Corinthians in fear and trembling it wasn't that he feared them but the fear the trembling of acknowledging God declaring God for who he is and you'll notice here at least eight different attributes of God. This is the foundation of all true gospel preaching. It's founded on who God is and how he manifests his glory through 
his attributes. Here it says that he is jealous and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. These are terms that our generation doesn't even know concerning God. In fact, when you read this, a lot will say, well, that's just the Old Testament God. Well, God hasn't changed. The only reason why he has not poured out his wrath even on our nation is his forbearance. And secondly, because he has that remnant that he gave to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ came and redeemed. Otherwise, we as a nation here in the United States are no better than this nation of the Assyrians, where Nineveh is its chief capital. If you remember that it was Nimrod who first established Nineveh as a place of power. If you go back to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 11, I don't want to get too far off my text here, but I believe this is important to consider. And here was a place back in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 11 that describes Nimrod. That's where the Tower of Babel would have been. And the whole purpose of that Tower of Babel was to build a place of worship. It was a ziggurat. That it wasn't just that God was mad because they were building a skyscraper. But rather that it was here that, that he sought to build this, this place of worship. And you can see in verse 10 of Genesis 10, it says, And the beginning of this kingdom was Babylon. So all of this is in Babylon, and what would be known as Iraq today, but Nineveh would have been up in the northern part. And it says, Out of the land went forth Asher. That's where you get the, the name Assyria from Asher and build at Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Kala. You can go and study those particular cities. But these were cities where they were designed with walls and temples and palaces, inscriptions. They give us those today reliefs that tell us about what it would have been like. And when you talk about walls and temples and palaces, that's really what you have in religion today. And this was the reason why God now is bringing his wrath, declaring wrath upon all forms of idolatry. Here again we see where the justice of God is against all forms of idolatry. He's God and he'll have no rivals. So he describes this as reserving wrath for his enemies. There are those that are vessels of wrath. They'll never know God in truth. They were raised up for one purpose, that God might reveal his power in their destruction. Of course, we know there are vessels of mercy as well. When Jonah went and preached to this city 100 years previous, there, it was obvious that there were some that the Lord had purposed that should be converted. Those are vessels of mercy. So we see God's attribute here in his jealousy and in his wrath. But it says also in verse 3, God is slow to anger. We're not to think that somehow God is reacting to what men do. That if he were, he would have destroyed them immediately. But here we see something of his forbearance. And it says great in power. That's the omniscience of God omnipotence of God, whereby he, in him is the power to do with his own what he will. Here's an attribute that is denied in our day because they make God a little G-O-D in man's hands, but we read this declaration. He will not acquit the wicked. Don't think that God is a loving God. And, and oh, by the way, you'll notice in here, we don't see the word love. God's love is in his son, and he will not acquit the wicked. That's why he spared not his only son, but delivered him up for us all. All that God purposed to save, 
that Christ might answer to his law and justice. And it says here that the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. What power, what majesty. Every time you see a storm, a wind blows up, that's God. You know, people deny it. They say, well, God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't send a tsunami. He wouldn't send a hurricane. Well, that's who's directing it. And all of this is according to his purpose and will. He rebuketh the sea, verse 4, and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. That harks back to when the Lord delivered Israel from Egypt and he rebuked the sea, the waters of the Red Sea. People try to deny it and say it was in a dry season when they crossed over. It, it, you read the narrative of their crossing over there in Exodus and, and those walls were wind that blew were, were high above the people that passed through them. That was God doing it. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishes. When God's pleased to bring a drought, the end is going to be languishing. There's not going to be, there, there's times and seasons when the Lord shuts up the, the, the skies in the day of Elijah. Any place that prospers dare not think that somehow it's because they're better than any other place. Now, this is the Lord God who does all of these things and works as he will according to his sovereign purpose. When we read here in, in verse 5, the mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in his the fierceness of his anger? This is describing the kind of God that the scriptures reveal. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. There's no refuge for sinners, even in the highest mountain or hiding in the hills. If it's not Christ the rock, there's no escape. And then you read here. The Lord is good. I love this. And a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. How does he know them that trust in him? He's the one that has ordained that they should trust in him. And given them that faith to look to Christ. And that's how we see that the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ endured. That's what his suffering was about. That day of trouble. It fell on him. He went through that day of trouble that God might be just and justified. And he know of them that trust in him. Who are those that trust in him but those for whom Christ paid the sin debt? And that's what the Lord says. Of all that the Father gave him, he'd not lose one. But would surely draw them to himself. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. This is Nahum describing the destruction of Nineveh that should take place in a few hundred years from the time that he was raised up to declare this. And I'm sure, like many today, they can't envision the even our nation ever being destroyed. But we're living in times right now, if you got up on January 1st and thought that somehow this was going to be some kind of peaceable year, and you look what the Lord's bringing this nation through and shaking it to its roots, and it's still not over. We don't know what the Lord is purpose. I just know this, that it's God doing it. And he'll get the glory one way or another. And for those of us that are the Lord's, our strength is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who endured the wrath of God on behalf Half of such as we are and those who trust in him I, it's not when, when everything's peaceful and quiet that we trust in him it's it's in times of trouble but the Lord knows those that are his and he is good he's good in his very being even 
in the worst of our troubles, we have to say that we receive far more than what we deserve as far as mercy goes. In his, in his goodness, he acts as he will in that goodness. That's not dependent upon man. It's who he's purpose to show his goodness to. I like that word good when it says there in verse 7. The Lord is good. The Lord is God. That word good means God. So everything that he purposes and declares is good. And there, even though there's an overflowing flood that will make an utter end of sinners as enemies, yet we know that there is that remnant that God has purposed to save. In specifics here in verse 8, when it's talking about an overrunning flood to make an end of Nineveh historically, that's how this was fulfilled, according to certain historic records during the final siege of Nineveh by a rebel army of Persians and Medes and Arabians and Babylonians. They, the Lord brought them all against this city. There were some unusually heavy rains that caused the rivers to flood and undermine the city's walls, and then those walls collapsed. It wasn't the army knocking down these walls, but God. And therefore, the invading armies entered the city through this breach in its defenses. No matter what man determines, you can put up walls all day long, but if God purposes to bring them down, he'll bring them down. And so the utter end, you notice that? The utter end, when God purposes to act in his justice, what do you imagine, verse 9, against the Lord? These are enemy armies that the Lord was bringing against or would bring against Nineveh when Nahum was writing this. But he will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. In other words, he's, he's not planned. And history records that this old city of Nineveh was completely lost. Completely. No, no ruins or anything until they went over and started digging around some archaeologists and around the 1840s and found down underneath the surface some of these ruins. But that, that city has never been raised up again. The utter end. When God says he'll do, he does. And this is our Lord's power and sovereignty being shown. As it says, for while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble, fully dry. They weren't expecting this end. They had confidence in their power. They gave glory to their, their walls and their cities and would not see, could not see, that they were nothing more than stubble fit for the fire. That's how the Lord describes them here, the dry leftover stalks of grass ready to be devoured by the smallest flame. This was how ripe Nineveh was in God's time for judgment and how complete that fire of judgment would be when it, when it would come. This is a God our, our generation doesn't know, and yet he's God. And so we're reading about this. There's one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. So it's describing here Certain ones that were raised up in, in that day, and like in Israel, they were promising peace and prosperity and safety, and yet were against the Lord and a wicked counselor in, like we have in modern day, peace, peace, when there is no peace. People preaching the, the love of God that know nothing of the holiness or wrath of God, and how God is just to destroy sinners. So no consequence for him to cast sinners into hell. That's who he is. And But for his mercies and grace in Christ, such would be our end. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. When he shall pass through. Doesn't that remind you of Egypt? The death angel coming through and taking the firstborn, all those that didn't have the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorposts and lentils. That's the only safety for any, 
this life, we're going to die one way or another. God has already ordained that, that end. But eternally, our only hope of salvation is that when Christ came and paid the debt, when he died, he died for me. And he says, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Such was the judgment that the Lord would bring. There's no second chances like people talk about. That when the Lord has purposed any sinners to condemnation, that condemnation is final, full. For now will I break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. It's talking there about the Lord bringing deliverance for his people in Judah. That here was this wicked enemy that continued to exercise its authority and power over what was left of the, the remnant of Judah. And yet in the Lord's time, he would break the yoke and burst the bonds in sunder. And the Lord gave, hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image I will make thy grave for thou art vile. That's what God thinks of any form of idolatry. They, when it talks here of, of the house of thy gods, how even our generation, people are proud of their places of worship. They invest lots of money in it. They stand as citadels for people to see from afar. People flock because it, it looks so impressive to their eyes. And yet the Lord says, it's a grave. It's there I will make thy grave for thou art vile. These monuments that you see to man's folly are nothing but tombs with dead bones in them. People go and pursue their way of worship, but it's not the true worship of God as it is in Christ. And that's the end of any that the Lord has so purpose for condemnation. But look at verse 15. Ah, uh, there's hope. Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. This is quoted by Isaiah in Isaiah 52, 7, but it's also quoted by Paul in Romans 10, 15. The good news, the good tidings of those that the Lord sends forth to preach the gospel of Christ and publish peace, true peace, not peace at any, any price, but Peace at the cost of the very death of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby he reconciled unto himself that people that he purposed to save. One time, one place, one sacrifice, justified forever. So he says, O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts. That was because they were to keep these until Christ came and fulfilled them. Perform thy vows in coming with those sacrifices. They were looking unto God to be their deliverer and savior when Christ would come. For the wicked shall pass no more through thee. He is utterly cut off. What a beautiful picture of the work of Lord Jesus Christ, whereby he once for all paid the sin debt. And uh, therefore, there is now no condemnation. So much more here. But this is a reading to help us consider these things. And I pray that the Lord would bless what we've heard today. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how deep, how profound it. And also ask forgiveness for how poorly we read the word. Take it for granted. Take a book like Nahum and think, well, it's old and hard to understand. And so we overlook it and pass on. But I pray, Lord, that you would, as we go through the scriptures and read and make these comments that you would stir our hearts and cause us to see that every part of this is your inspired word. It's for our learning and it's for your glory and the honor of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for it. I pray that our hearts be prepared as we continue to worship you and look into your word. I give you thanks and praise and honor and glory in your, your son's name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and sing one more hymn. Let's turn to hymn number 351. 
Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my ransom soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my ransom soul shall find rest beyond the river Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadows o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever. Till I reach the golden strand, just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. Till my ransom soul shall find. Rest beyond the river. Precious song. Let's take our Bibles in the remaining time and look together in 2 Corinthians chapter 19. And my text for this message is from verse 21 down to verse 37. I'll speak with you about the defense of the defenseless who is Christ for his people. We're defenseless when it comes to our sin. We could never overcome it ourselves. This world, the law, we stand before the law condemned. Were it not that Christ should be our defense and Satan himself. People today trifle even with Satan thinking that somehow they have some power to defeat him. Yet man in his best state was brought down by Adam back there in the garden. So who are we to think that somehow now in a fallen state we can somehow take him on? So that's who we are as defenseless creatures except that the Lord should raise up our defender. That's really how God is described here for his people, that defender. It's like the hymn writer said, we're not the right man on our side. Our striving would be losing. So I want us to see how the Lord proves himself faithful. It's not us, it's him. But when you begin here in verse 21 that we left off with last time, and again, remember here, we just read about Nahum and the king of Assyria. So all of this here that we're reading about, Nahum would have lived during this era. Isaiah, in verse 20, says, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah. So Isaiah himself was a prophet at this particular time. 
Nahum followed Isaiah, but nonetheless, you can understand the historic context here. Here's this Assyrian army, the most powerful of the day, that was coming up against Jerusalem. They'd already taken many cities around Judah, and now it was their intent to take Jerusalem and even had it under siege. It's difficult for us to understand in that day when a nation put another city under siege, it was a slow starvation, death. And yet everyone that died, God purposed to die. The Lord was using this army to bring about his judgments on the land of Israel and even around Judah, but it wasn't up to Sennacherib, even though he was king of Assyria, it wasn't up to him to determine the end. And so Hezekiah had sent for a word from Isaiah as to how the Lord would have him respond. And so in verse 21, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him, concerning Sennacherib, concerning this king of Assyria. And we could say by type, this king of Assyria represented the very enemy of God, whether Satan or sin, whatever that would seek to destroy and devour this people. Here's the message of hope, just like we saw in Nahum. This is the, the good news of the sound of the feet upon the mountains, bringing peace. Not to everybody, but to that people there in Judah that God had purposed to save for Christ's sake. And notice here he calls them the virgin. The daughter of Zion hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. This was a word of peace to say that because God had purposed to preserve this city at this time, it was like a virgin daughter that stands in the face of this wicked king to which the king can do no harm. You think of a virgin daughter, you think of one that is undefiled. And yet here the king of Assyria was seeking to defile this very one that God had set apart for his honor and glory. It's a type of the church. In fact, over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you look there with me, in verse 2, this is how Paul wrote concerning the Lord's people there in his day and his jealousy over the church as that virgin daughter, jealous over these false suitors, if you will, that would come to seek and take away her virginity. That's really what the picture is here. And the Lord said, no matter what the king of Assyria had proposed, that the virgin, the virgin of the daughter of Zion would despise, would scorn. In other words, would not be able to do what he intended with her, just like all of those Judaizers in Paul's day that went about seeking to undo the message of Christ and the church's perfection in him sought to bring them again into bondage through their preaching of works and rules and regulations and law. That's why Paul said to the Galatians, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And that this virgin daughter of Jerusalem would shake her head at thee. In other words, there's no condemnation. There's nothing that man can do unto those that Christ has owned as his own and has paid their sin debt. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, would to God ye would bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Being a chaste virgin doesn't mean that in our flesh we are in any way pure. But in Christ and the work that he's accomplished, that imputed righteousness, this is how God looks upon that people. Just like back here, Judah, you say, well, what was Jerusalem? Well, they were just as 
evil as the rest of them, but God, for Christ's sake, had purpose to preserve them. And so even though the city at that time seemed vulnerable in, in light of over 185,000 troops that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, had lined up against Jerusalem to put Jerusalem under siege, the Lord is saying here, and this is through the word of Isaiah, that that virgin daughter of Zion, this is one that is a picture of, of Christ's church, would end up despising and laughing to scorn. They did that with our Lord. They laughed him to scorn. And yet in the end, by his death, burial, and resurrection, those for whom he paid the debt, they triumphed even over those that laughed him to scorn. So here's a picture. He said, well, what is it to be a virgin? Well, to be unpolluted from the gross idolatry of the day. What sets the Lord's people apart in our day is that they do not defile themselves with the false message of works religion and the gross idolatry that exists today. Just take a look around and see how people worship today in, in the name of Christendom. I won't say in the name of Christ, but they call it Christianity, and yet you compare what they do for worship to the pagans of the world and how they worship, there really is no difference in form. It's emotionalism, it's coming with the works of their own hands, self-will, go right on down the list. That's a picture of a prostitute. But for the virgin, the daughter of Zion, where you see Zion in Hebrews, that's a picture of the church. We see that the Lord himself is their defense. You have a picture of a virgin, a young maiden that's, that seems vulnerable, and yet the Lord is her defense. And we can say the same thing. Those of us that God has chosen in Christ Lord God is our defense, and therefore we are free from, you think about losing virginity, but the raping of Sennacherib and the Assyrians, the raping of world's religion, the Lord set us apart. In fact, to this point, the city of Jerusalem, back here in my text, had never been invaded or conquered by another army since the days of David, when David took it. That's a picture of the Lord's protection over his people that he has purposed to save. And so here's God's word to the king of Assyria and his representative. Remember, they're right at the door and they're blaspheming. They were talking in loud noise to be able to have those that heard them be discouraged. And again, Hezekiah is a type and picture of Christ the mediator, to whom shall we go? It's like Peter and the other disciples answered when the Lord said, will you also go away? To whom shall we go? You are the ones that has the words of eternal life. And we see that, we saw that last time in verse 15 of 2 Kings 19, that Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwells between the cherubim, thou art the God, even thou alone, all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. He's praying as a mediator here. And the Lord was hearing through the word, through his prophet Isaiah. So here's the word, verse 22 of our text. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Stop and consider. Any that blaspheme against the Lord God, as he's revealed here, here in scripture, or seek to pervert his word like so many do. When they read these scriptures, they're not seeing the God that I'm declaring unto you right now, nor did I for some time. He was a little G-O-D, and it was up to us to work with him, cooperate with him to get his will accomplished. That's the way most people view it. Here's God and, and here's man and, and they've got to work together to get help their little G-O-D get the work done. But the Lord caused such thinking blasphemy 
He says, and against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? When people will pit their own supposed free will up against the will of God and make that statement, like you hear so many say, well, God has his will, but he's not going to violate man's will. That's blasphemy. Man has a will, but it is in subjection to the will of God. And there's nothing that breathes or moves but what God ordains it. And stop and think about when somebody pits their little will up against God and his will and his sovereignty. Here he says, even against the Holy One of Israel. All the way down through here, have you seen the word love yet? God is a God of love. He is love, but he loves his righteousness. That's the answer to those that say, well, I don't understand how God can be loving and still send sinners to hell. He loves his righteousness. And unless Christ has satisfied that righteousness on your behalf as a sinner, there is no hope. You stand against the Holy One of Israel. That's a term that's used in the New Testament of Christ. Even the devils knew him to be such and trembled, but men don't. They believe that somehow in the end, everybody's going to be okay because God is love and he'll eventually overlook their faults. That's not the God of the Bible. Verse 23, and the Lord is addressing this word here to Sennacherib and to really Rabshakeh. He's speaking through Isaiah here, but remember Rabshakeh was Sennacherib's general that had brought this right to the gates of Jerusalem. And so he's letting him know that all of his boastful speaking was contrary to the holiness of God. He didn't know who he was dealing with. When I consider thinking back even some of my own thoughts about God that I was trained to believe, it's not that the word has changed, but in this word, God is clearly revealed, but why don't we see him as such? It's because until it pleases God to reveal in us his holy character and justice, we'll never see him. It's by his spirit. But when Reb Shecky sent these messengers, to scare and to cause fear to ring in the hearts of, of the people. The Lord says that, by thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord. I think about how many are going out into the world today with the name of Christ, the name of God on their lips. They're messengers, but they're false messengers. John wrote about it and said, many false preachers have gone out into the world, many. Don't think that somehow because the numbers are so great that somehow the Lord's with them. No. Thy messengers, by thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord and has said, with the multitude of my chariots. You see what they're defending here? They're giving the glory to their own power. By my will, by the multitude of my chariots. Their strength in numbers. I am come up to the height of the mountains to the sides of Lebanon and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof and the choice fir trees thereof and I will enter into the lodgings of his border and into the forest of his carnal. These are all the products that they were looking for to take to make them their own and give them the glory to their name. I have digged and drunk strange waters and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places, that is of, of fenced places, Hast thou not heard? Again, the Lord is still directing this to this army that gives the power and glory to their own power and all that was accomplished of ancient times that I have formed it. Now have I brought it to pass. You see what's common through all this? I, I, I. That's how people that don't know God testify themselves of what they've done and it's foolishness. Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldst be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field 
and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as the corn blasted before it be grown up. That's how they dealt with even some of these cities in Ju Ju Judah that uh, surrounding Jerusalem that had their forces of defense and that these came and it was like nothing. But the Lord says to these in verse 27, See this, you could take the example even of Saul of Tarsus. He was breathing out wrath against the, the church of God and, and with some success, thinking that he was something until the Lord stopped him. They're on the road to Damascus and brought him low. The Lord says, I know thy abode. He not only knows those that are his, but he knows every one of his enemies. And thy going out and thy coming in and thy rage against me. The, the enemy will attack the church, but it's really a rage against God and who he is. They're not against, the enemy isn't, isn't against any that preach a little G.O.D. That's in man's hands to do with whatever he will. But I'll tell you this, there's a rage against the sovereign Lord God. And his glory and honor and strength and power to rule as he will. But he says, because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come up into mine ears. When I think of a tumult, I, I think of the noise. We don't hear it. We're in a closed building, but if you could somehow listen in during the time of worship on a Sunday or even on Wednesday and hear all the babbling going on and false religion, there's a lot of noise. But don't think that somehow God's looking the other way. All of these things is nothing more than building up wrath against wrath against the day of wrath, as Paul wrote about there in Romans chapter 2. And he says here in verse 28, they saw themselves as being self-accomplished. They saw themselves, owing themselves, their success even though they didn't know that it was the Lord that was giving them that success up to a point to accomplish his judgments. You say, well, why would God give them that success for his purpose and his power to manifest his power, even in his judging those that he purposed for condemnation? But now the Lord is saying here, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou camest. There's an interesting perspective that when the Assyrians would come in and take captives to keep them lined up, they would literally take a large fish hook and run it through the nose or the lips of each captive and string them all together and march them that way. Oh, that seems abhorrent. But the Lord is basically saying, whatever you have allowed, now I'm going to bring against you. And this is how I'll deal with you. And my justice do the same thing to you. That was their practice. But when you come down now to verse 29, see, this is what I love reading. You read far enough, it's dark. Yes, when you hear the wrath of God, His holiness and justice against sinners. But here God shows that he's going to prosper Judah. It says in verse 29, This shall be a sign unto thee. He, he shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. Remember, they had been besieged and hadn't been able to even go out and plant crops to have anything to eat. But the Lord is saying that in whatever was being planted, the Assyrians were there for, for three years surrounding Jerusalem. So they planted fields. They went out and they had to nurture their armies. So while they were attacking Jerusalem, at the same time they were planting fields. And this is what the Lord is saying. You should this year such things as grow of themselves. In other words, you didn't have anything to do with it, but everything that grows, the Lord purposed for them. And in the second year, that which springeth of the same. And in the third year, so ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. He's foretelling that even though these were dark days for them, there would be a time when they would go back to planting and sowing and reaping. That's the Lord's mercies. 
I don't know if we really appreciate that so much until what we have the Lord takes away. We're living some difficult times now where they got businesses shut down and people wondering how they're gonna make it. Well, the Lord is capable to even make it worse than what we'd ever imagined. Some of us may not even be thinking in terms of because there is no work, because businesses are closed, that somehow we'd have to go back to eating whatever food we plant. We don't know what the Lord has purpose. I certainly don't. And yet in all things the Lord is directing. But I know this, there is that remnant. You can see here in verse 30. There is that remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah. There's always that picture of the remnant that the Lord is going to preserve even through the worst of times and shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. You say, why that remnant? Well, as you continue to read on, we find out the reason. Why is it that the Lord spares some? Well, it's his mercy and grace. Paul spoke about it over in Romans chapter 11. In verse 5, there is this day a remnant according to what? The election of grace. That is, if it hadn't been for God's grace, we'd all have been like Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. And they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. When you see Mount Zion and a remnant escaping out of that mount, don't think in terms of just the physical deliverance. This is talking about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is forward-looking to when Christ would come. And out of Zion, that's where Jerusalem sat upon that hill, the Lord would accomplish his will in delivering a remnant unto his name that would be preserved forever. That's the elect of God. That's those that the Father gave him to save. And their salvation's in him. The work is the Lord's. Ours is the sin. People ask all the time, what's our part? It's the sin. But the work of salvation is the Lord's. So he says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city. That's amazing. He's right at the door. He's been besieging the city all this time. And yet the Lord said he'll not set foot in it, nor shoot an arrow there nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return. Who is it that directs all things? It's the Lord. It's not just that he's in control, like you hear people say. No, he's directing. Just like the waves of the sea, they'll come so far, no further, and they go back. That's what he's saying about this. And this is a fierce enemy. Take some time to go study Assyria, study the armies, military strategies. They were ruthless. Who could stand? It's just a picture of even the wrath of God. Who could stand? But the Lord says here in verse 34, I will defend this city to save it. That's the message. The defender of the defenseless. It's not an our strength, but he'll do it why? For my own sake. Why does he save some and condemn others? For his own sake. But notice, even, that word and, even for my servant David's sake. Well, David had already been dead for 300 years. But what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about that promise that he made to David when David was yet alive, that he would raise up a seed of his lineage and preserve that seed. And so here, 300 years later, God is faithful. God is just. How do we know that God's word is true? Well, look how he's dealt faithfully according to his word in the past, and that's exactly how you can hope for him in, in the future. The, the Lord, he says, he would defend his city, and he would do it in his way. This all is a picture, when you stop and consider, of a battle raging. But thank God that battle is over, just like here, the battle's over. We're reading now what was being prophesied to come to pass and was accomplished. Just like when we come to the gospel, we're reading about a battle that is over, that the Lord Jesus Christ came and out of Zion, as it describes there, delivered a remnant. Who's that remnant? But the people that the Father gave him. There's a hymn 
that has been written. I love the tune, I love the words. It is finished. And it describes a line that is drawn through the ages, and on that line stands the old rugged cross. I would say the Christ of the cross. And on that cross, a battle was raging for the gain of man's soul for its loss. In other words, how decisive was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to save those that the Father had given him. He says, the lyrics go on, on one side march the forces of evil, all the demons and all the devils of hell. That's what's represented here by these Assyrians. On the other, the Lord of glory, and they meet on Golgotha's hill. The earth shakes with the force of the conflict. The sun refuses to shine. There's, when you read about what took place there at Calvary, there hangs God's son in the balance. And then through the darkness, he cries. That's the last word. The, the, the Lord didn't die death of a whimper. He died in victory. He said, it is finished. The battle is over. It is finished. There will be no more war. Not for those for whom he paid the debt. It's finished. The end of the conflict. It's finished. And Jesus is Lord. He's the conqueror. So we see that here when the Lord said, I will defend this city to save it. Not to try to save it. But I might need your help. I need you all getting together and let's line up and get a prayer chain going. No. I'll do it for mine own sake. And for my servant David's sake. See, that's the joyous Message is Christ was revealed in my heart to learn that the battle was over. And anything that the Lord was pleased to teach me of Christ, it was already accomplished. And it came to pass. That's my favorite phrase. It came to pass. Exactly as God ordained that that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, four score, and five thousand. 185,000 people. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. It's almost redundant, and the corpse is dead, but just for effect. That when God's purpose to bring about his judgment, he does it thoroughly, thoroughly. A lot of people trying to figure out how they died. Some said they, these soldiers had dysentery. It just says the Lord killed them. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. He was not of that 185,000 the Lord destroyed. But he said, well, why did the Lord preserve him alive? Long enough just to get back to his homeland and to tell the story of what the God of Israel had done, the true God. But when he got back there, it says it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God. You see, these things don't bring repentance. People think, well, if God would just shake the world, shake people's lives, and surely they're going to repent. No, it takes the Spirit of God. Where did he return to when he went back to Assyria? Back to the house of his God. Such is the deadness and the hardness of the heart that man will not repent, which means turn to the true God, even the Lord Jesus Christ, given all that he foresaw. But it says that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword. They're the ones that took him and killed him. And they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Azar had his son then reigned in his stead. And you talk about boldness and lifting up themselves against the Lord God. And I, I will tell you, such is the danger of those that hold the free will. It's an idol God. To them. It doesn't exist, but people still preach it up. They've discovered actual recordings of what Sennacherib wrote about his conquerors. And, and when you read it, you can see exactly what the Lord was attacking when he spoke of, I have digged and drunk strange water. I dried up all rivers of besieged. I have done it. I, I, I. That's a danger. I'll just read this and then we'll stop. But here's what he wrote. It's translated. I attacked Hezekiah of Judah, who had not subjected himself to me, and took 46 fortresses, forts and small cities. I carried away captive 200 to 150 people, big and small, both male and female, a multitude of horses, 
young bulls, asses, camels, and oxen. Hezekiah himself I locked up in Jerusalem like a bird in its cage. This is Sennacherib writing it. It's readable to this day. I put up banks against the city. I separated his cities from whose inhabitants I had taken prisoners from his realm and gave him to Tenethi, king of Ashdod, Adi, king of Ekron, and Zilbel, king of Gaza. These are all his alliances there. And thus diminished his country. And I added another tax to the one imposed on him earlier. And he goes on and prays, but I, I, I. And yet well, what was his end? It was total destruction. Such will be the end of those that the Lord leaves to themselves. May he be merciful in teaching us of Christ. It shows just what a great work Christ has done and salvation in him. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 340. And we'll be dismissed. 340. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring, not as an offering to Jesus my King. Only my sinful, now contrite heart, grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine, sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages, Ever to be nearer, my Savior, still nearer to thee. Nearer, my Savior, still nearer to thee. Amen. All right, we'll look forward to it. next time, Lord willing.